All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. For those who might be new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So now that the school year is in full swing, we'll be broadcasting 30, 40, even 50 live events a month for classrooms. So you can head over to Exploring uh, by the seat.com if you want to check out the events that are coming up. All right, so we've got a great one today. Uh, really excited to introduce my friend, Callie Broadus. She founded Reserva, the Youth Land Trust to empower young people around the world to take solution-based action forward to solve our climate and biodiversity crisis. So she and her team are working to create the first entirely youth-funded uh, nature reserve. So it's in a beautiful uh, part of Ecuador, a cloud forest by the name of the, I hope I get this right, it's been a while since we've connected, uh, the Choco, but she will correct me if I am wrong. So I'm going to bring Callie in now. She's going to share some of her adventures and how students can get involved in some really cool uh, conservation opportunities. Hey, Callie. Hey, Joe. Oh, it's so great to see you. And gosh, after seeing that little reel in the beginning of the of the show there, I'm feeling really bad about my kitchen background. So my apologies to all the classrooms. This is nowhere near as exciting as a as a helicopter rhino chase like you had the other day. Don't worry about that at <laughs> all. We are all, I think, at home. Many of us working from home, so I think it's it's pretty normal. Yeah. Well, you you got it right. It's the Chaco Cloud Forest um, is the site that that we're working to protect. And so um, I actually have a little presentation that I'm going to show, which, as you know, I never do. I usually just blab, but um, I actually have assembled some photos and I want to take everyone uh, to the site onto an expedition that we went through last year. Um, this time last year, actually, it was exactly a year ago that you and I were talking with Exploring by the Seat and so many classrooms uh, via satellite phone from the cloud forest. So I'm going to take us back there and uh, walk through this this site, what's special about it, what animals live there, what it's like to be on that expedition in the muddy, muddy, wet cloud forest, um, and then what exactly we're, we're trying to do to, to help it. All right, well, it's queued up. The floor is yours, Callie. All right, sounds good. Well, I think I think I can just hit play here. Does that, does that show? Can everyone see it? Yeah, it looks good. All right, sounds good. So where we are going, is to the Chaco Cloud Forest. Now, everyone knows about the Amazon, right? Everyone is familiar with that giant, giant rainforest called the Amazon. Well, the Cloud Forest is a little bit different. It is located in the Andes Mountain Range, and that's off to the west side of South America and in a tiny, tiny country called Ecuador. And as you can see in the arrow up here, um, the site that we are visiting is at the very northwest corner of Ecuador in this um, in this Chaco Andes mountain area. Um, so what's different about a cloud forest is that it's it's uh, a higher elevation than that low elevation rainforest. So the low elevation it's very flat and um, you know species that might live in one patch of land have a pretty easy time migrating and you know moving one direction or the other. So when we have deforestation in areas like the Amazon, um, the species are usually not really necessarily under threat uh, because the species can continue to exist in another part. But what's happening in the cloud forest is because they're on mountains, you have species that are ac accustomed to living at just 2000 meters of elevation and no higher or no lower or just particularly in this one really humid spot, but just on the other side of the mountain, it's much sunnier and it can't survive. So you have this high level of, um, of what we call biodiversity, which is the, the diversity of, of life, um, the different types of life living in the area. And uh, you have species that, you know, if you have a, an area of forest that's cut down in the Chaco, in this cloud forest, it's really hard for these species to go anywhere else. So uh, we, we experience a lot of biodiversity loss in this region. Um, in Ecuador, the, the lowland tropical uh, Chaco cloud forest is heavily deforested. It's down to about 2% of its former range. And as you creep up the mountains, it's a little bit better. It's around 10 to 30%. No one's really sure exactly how much is left because it's really hard to analyze with all the clouds. 
So uh, what my organization is doing is we're trying to protect 244 acres of this site entirely through the efforts of youth and kids. So we are um, really excited about it, but I'll talk about that at the end. What I wanna show you is what it looks like on the ground. So this is our partner. He's our expedition leader. His name is Javier Robayo, and he is the manager for our partner organization, Fundacion Ecominga. He is really inspired and excited by the next generation. And so he has taken it upon himself to hire an entire team of only young people to manage this site. Um, and so he is the leader who took us, me and two other uh, kids from, one from the US and one from uh, England, and as well as a slew of scientists and other young uh, conservationists that were in the area to the site to explore and study it. So this is what it looks like when you step inside a cloud forest. First you look up and it seems like the forest just sort of disappears into the sky, into the clouds. It just goes completely white. And then when you hike up that ridge, so the photo on the left is just from the ground looking up. And then the photo on the right is standing inside that forest looking out. And you see how incredibly lush and rich it is. Every single tree is kind of like a hotel for animals. You see that this there's one tree trunk that you can see on the right and there are bromeliads growing on it, growing on it. And there's lichens and there's moss up in the branches. These trees are just hosts for all other types of plants and animals. And the cloud forest uh, in the Chaco is home to an incredible diversity of life. So this particular site is home to some very flashy animals. So on the bottom left here, we see the brown headed spider monkey. This is one of the most Im important animals on our site. And that's not because one animal is inherently more important than another, but because there are so few of this monkey species left. There are so few of them. There's, I, I don't think we actually have an exact estimate, but it's fewer than 2000. I think it's around 250 to 500 animals left in Ecuador. And they go in these big uh, family groups of like 20 monkeys at a time. So when you have people um, finding them for you know sub subsistence hunting, um, they are able to take out more than one at a time. And that's, so it's not good for the monkey. Um, so this monkey is living on our site. On the right hand side, we also have this amazing cat called the ocelot. It's a small wild cat. This photo is taken by Sean Grazer, who's a great photographer. And uh, we have this up top, the Bolito Glosa. It's a type of lungless salamander. And these guys are so cool because, I mean, if you can imagine breathing without your lungs, that's what these things do. They actually breathe through their skin. And another cool fact about them is that they have the fastest tongues in the animal kingdom, even faster than the chameleon. And then on the top right there, we have some amazing birds, over 800 bird species in this area. This is the cock of the rock. And it's just flashy and red and, and um, they're, well, you know, it just sort of speaks for itself how cool that is. But you see them all over the place. And there's some really big animals too. So some of you may know this, especially if you're based on the West Coast or in Florida. This is the cougar, also known as the puma or mountain lion. And I'm just gonna play a little video to see, show you how they are using our site. So this is a big male caught on the camera trap. This is one of the ways that we study this site is by setting up remote cameras so that animals can trigger them as they walk by and they'll start filming. So this male has just marked this spot right here and the female came by and smelled it. And so she's trying to figure out where he is. And there he goes. He's just made his little mark and he walks off into the forest. So we get a lot of that kind of stuff on these camera traps. Another one of the large animals that we get is called the spectacled bear. This bear is also known as Paddington bear um, in the UK because uh, Paddington bear is that, that cute little character um, and he's got those cute markings on his face. He is actually a spectacled bear. Um, they're also known as Andean bears, which is kind of the more accurate term uh, because they do live in the Andes mountains. So this video on the right here is um, it shows the bear and its feeding behavior. So it goes all the way up these huge trees to eat miniature avocados. They're little miniature wild, wild avocados. And this video was taken actually pretty close to Quito, which is the capital city 
of Ecuador uh, at Maki Pukuna Lodge. And um, those are friends of ours, but this bear wasn't on our site, but it is, um, this is one of the species that you'll find. And look at how cute and curious they are. Um, and we did actually find you a home of a bear on a our bear hike. List. So this is Javier. To rest, sleep, to pass the night. Explaining. Totally dry and on the no room. <laughs> there we go. Explaining so that he can how this is the den of a bear. So the bears will sometimes come in here to rest. Um, they'll spend a lot of their time up in the trees when they're up in the mountains, but then they'll find dry, big, empty areas like this to rest. And it could be in the middle of the day or at night. That was on our site. It's also home to more than 800 bird species, including really cool hummingbirds like this one on the left, the sword-billed hummingbird. On the top right here, the plate-billed mountain toucan. And uh, it's a really cool bird that kind of sounds like this. And I give you full license to mock me, but it goes, brah, brah. it's a pretty cool bird. And the blue around its face is really flashy. Um, and then the little the little fat one at the bottom, that's called the orange-breasted fruit eater, and it makes a really high-pitched whistling sound. It also has perhaps the highest level of orchid diversity in the entire world. So this species on the left, we're very lucky to have found on our site. It's called Phragmopedium fisheri, or Fisher's Phragmopedium, and it is the rarest plant in all of Ecuador. IUCN, which is the governing body of of nature, basically, um, believes that there are between 10 and 100 individuals of this plant left in the wild. And we know that there are at least five of them on our site. So if you can imagine that, it's a really rare plant. And then sometimes you find plants that aren't even found yet. They're not even discovered yet. We don't even know what they are. So these two species on the right are brand new. And uh, so once we, I just wanted to give you that quick overview of what lives in this forest. And now I'll just show you a little bit of what it looks like to go on expedition. So first of all, it's a cloud forest, which means that we are always wet. We are always basically living in a cloud and that means everything is wet. Here's Lucy's butt. It's totally muddy all the time. And if you're not careful, you're gonna fall over and get completely drenched. But on expedition, we we bring our tents, but we don't pitch, pitch them in that mud because if you do, you're just gonna get completely drenched. So um, our partner hired some, some local staff from the local indigenous and, um, and local communities to build this platform. So we can pitch our tents up in this cozy platform. Here on the left is our orchid specialist, Marco. And on the right is a park guard named Danielle. And they are, they are hanging out in the platform of the expedition. This is where we put our tent. So that's my tent there in the middle. So we're really, really cramped. And as you can imagine, if there's someone who's snoring or who's talking in their sleep, that makes it pretty tough for everyone to sleep. But everyone's so sore and exhausted from all the hiking all day that it doesn't really make a big difference. And then from, this is a little window, a little crack in the screen sort of uh, from that tent area looking down, that's me talking to Javier, going over some photos there. So uh, what you see there is a little window with a, and it, there's a tiny little ladder that goes up to that spot. And we always had to take our shoes off at the bottom and come up so we wouldn't make this kind of bark pine, um, uh, bark floor dirty. Um, and here we are inside. So if you go down a level, this, this bark floor is actually quite soft, but but it's very ripply. And so uh, if, if, your, if your mattress wasn't very good, it was, it was definitely bumpy to sleep on. But as I said, you're so tired, it doesn't really matter. And then up on top, we have these clear plastic um, rain covers. And so that kept us safe from the rain. We also had a friend. So this is Lupita. And she helped us stay just happy and having fun all the time. She's um, one of the um, indigenous Awa communities, um, from one of the indigenous Awa communities, and her sister was there helping us cook and making sure that everyone could focus on the science, um, but she just helped us play. So when we were having a break, Lupita played with us, and it was really fun. And then this is the overhang. So if you see there's a table in the background, this is Lucy, who's one of Reserva's youth council members who came. 
um, and you see there's a table behind her, that's where the scientists did all of their work. So they would be dissecting animals or plants or, um, you know, look, looking at things more closely through a little um, magnifying glass to see if they could tell if something was an odd structure in a plant or something like that. So that's that dry area that's still covered, but it is outside for them to work. And some of the animals that we found were really surprising. So for example, this species, we didn't expect to find there. This is called the Pachincha giant glass frog. And it's listed as vulnerable on the IUCN website, but they believe that they're going to be reclassifying this frog as critically endangered. So we were very, very happy to find this frog on our site. Sometimes the frogs didn't really want to be photographed. This one is called Nymphargus grandisoni. It's called the red spotted glass frog. And you can see that red spot right in between its eyes. Um, it actually has those spots all over its body, but it was really jumpy. So here you can see from one, one image to the next, it just tries to get out of the way. And more, than, more often than not, it wound up on my head or on my camera or in my camera. Um, it, was a, it was a jumpy frog. Sometimes they just were really mobile. So this is that lungless salamander I mentioned, the Bolita glossa. And it just wouldn't stop moving. So I was trying to photograph it and it was just walking and walking and it would always walk to the edge of a leaf and then just dangle off like this until it dropped. Um, so as I said, these guys are really cool. Um, they have the fastest tongues in the animal kingdom, but if you see their face there, like the little, something that looks like a mustache, that means that this is a male. So they also have really interesting facial features that help you tell them apart. And then sometimes, the animals just sort of walked into the scene. So we didn't have an entomologist there, which is someone who studies insects and bugs. We didn't have an entomologist with us. So these were just sort of fun to see, but um, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty cool animals. So if you look at that, I, I guess it's a weevil on the right hand side and see its little mouth part all the way, way out there so far away from its eyes. I'm so sorry about my dirty fingernails. Um, that's just after a few days, it's not much you can do. And then just that iridescent, incredible blue. So I, I would love to know more about insects so I could go back and, and find out what these are. And it's all worth it. All the mud, all the crazy animals, all the weird sleepless nights because ultimately you wind up with experiences like this. So while on a hike, Javier Marco stopped. I told you Marco is our orchid researcher. Javier Marco stopped and Javier said, Marco, Marco, look at this. And he brought out this tiny little micro, uh, magnifying glass that he has in his hand there. And he looked really closely at this flower that's about one millimeter in diameter. And look at how excited they are. What they have just found is a whole new species. So listen to Javier. If you just try to see by the side, not to the front of the side, you would see the shape of the petals. It looks like So they were looking at the shapes of the petals and they said, there is no orchid that we know of that looks like this. So just like that, they made a discovery. And that's what's so cool about this region is that it's very understudied and you can just go on a walk. And if you're, if you're an expert, you might find something new. So that was the end of our expedition. And then we had to walk out. So I'm not going to play this whole video, but uh, sometimes where the cattle like where local people have um, have cattle, the cattle have really mucked up the trails and it turns into this. So we had about an eight mile walk in this. And as you can see, it doesn't really go very quickly sometimes because as what just happened to Carter, sometimes your boot comes off and you just wind up plunging your foot completely into the mud. Your Javier is stuck and that goes on for miles. So basically what we're trying to do is to make sure that forest like this at the top doesn't turn into a mountain like this at the bottom. So this mountain on the bottom used to look like the one on the top. It was a cloud forest, but little by little, patch by patch, it was burned down, it was cut down, and ultimately that forest was lost. And it's gonna be very hard to recover that area. So um, we're trying to fight biodiversity loss and climate change and land degradation by preserving these forests so that 
you know, we can keep them intact for future generations. One little thing, this is my last note before I move on. Um, one little thing is we need to make sure that as we're protecting these forests, we take into account that there are people living in this area who still need to live. They need to make a livelihood. They need to be able to afford food for their families. Um, and that means that sometimes they need to use the land. So this, uh, what we're seeing here is, is illegal, um, but uh, it's the kind of thing that we can only stop if we provide alternative livelihoods for people. So that's something that we're working on as well. Uh, but what you're seeing here is three patches that have been burned in order to make pasture for cattle. Um, so what can you do to help? Well, there are a few things. So for us, number one, you can donate. So just $5 can save an, an area the size of a one bedroom apartment, about 600 square feet. Um, our partners at Rainforest Trust, they match every single dollar. So you can donate and it'll go twice as far. Um, these are Junyan, Junyan Kiano, or two of our two of our friends in India, two of the youth council members in India. They donated um, all of the money that they had made through chores. And um, a really cool idea that they had was to ask their parents if they donated their own money, would their parents match it? So that helped it go four times as far because if their parents match and the Rainforest Trust match. Another thing you can do if you don't have money is to raise it. So you can do a bake sale like Alice and Henry did here on the left um, or something different, something that maybe you haven't thought of before. Maybe you don't like baking. Just do something you really enjoy. James McCullough, who's one of our friends in the UK, in England, he's really, really good at identifying insects and all sorts of invertebrate species. So what he did was he went around to his neighbors and said, I would love to bio blitz your backyard and I'll just tell you what lives there. I bet you don't even know. And so his very first one he did, he came up with a list of 116 species that lived in his neighbor's backyard and just gave them a report. And his neighbor was so excited, so they donated to the reserve on his behalf because they were just so happy to have this information. Something else you can do is like a physical challenge. Joe Wilkins here on the bottom left just ran 45 miles this weekend for the rainforest, and he raised thousands of dollars, enough to protect six whole acres, six whole football fields of land. You can also pick a day, like Valentine's Day, and ask people to buy Valentine's. Um, or hold an event like this weekend. We have a trivia event happening on Sunday and we're, we're asking people to donate instead of buying tickets. You could even clean out your wardrobe here like Selena Chien is doing. Um, she's cleaning out her wardrobe, getting rid of, rid of stuff she's not really wearing anymore and she's found a place she can sell it and then the proceeds are going to purchase land. But there's one more thing you can do. You don't need to have money. You don't even need to be able to raise it. We have a program called the Million Letters Campaign which asks youth and kids to write letters just saying why you love nature and why it's important to protect places like the Chico and to protect these wild habitats. And if you just tell us why and maybe even draw a picture to illustrate it like this one on the right, then we will find a donor to match your letter with $3, which is enough to protect a classroom sized area of rainforest. So you don't have to have money. You don't even have to be able to raise it, but we would absolutely love your help. And then the very last thing, which I know I'm running out of time, so the very last thing that I'll say is we have a really cool competition happening right now, and it ends next week, so you need to engage with us quickly. But one of the things we found on this expedition was a brand new species of frog, and the scientists have given us the opportunity to name it. So if you have ever dreamed of naming a new species, this is your chance. So this is Helocyrtus, is the genus, and what we need is a species name. So it could be Helocyrtus um, awa, or it could be Helocyrtus choco, or it could be Helocyrtus anything, but we need you to give it a name. And so what we've done is if you go to our website, and I'm sorry, this is a lot of information, but if you go to our website, there's a whole web page that helps you understand about the, the frog's habitat, its physical characteristics here, like how it can change colors and how it's really, really got gr very grippy toes and how it's got uh, round fingertips, which is different from some of the other frogs in the area. Um, and it also tells you a little bit about the people who live around it and who help study it. It'll tell you about the location and the habitat. And so it'll give you a lot of information to help you come up with the perfect name. 
uh, for this frog. And then you can submit it. It's completely free, but it's only open to kids and youth up to 26. So we really, really need your help. That competition closes on the 30th. So um, that is all I have. And uh, yeah, I'd love to take some questions. All right. Awesome, Callie. Thanks so much for sharing that adventure. And thanks so much for sharing, you know, just some awesome ways uh, to get involved in conservation. And it's not, it's not complicated. It's all things students can do from home. Yeah. Uh, and five dollars can go so far, especially it's with math. It's actually kind of crazy how far it goes. Absolutely yeah. amazing. So uh, yeah, I expect all the classrooms tuning in via YouTube and Facebook, uh, all of the classrooms who are joining us live on camera today, uh, that you flood uh, that naming option. Uh, with, Please. With the because it would be so great and so cool if your name was chosen. It'd be pretty, pretty awesome. It, right. And it totally could be too. There are only about 250 entries right now. So you actually have a pretty good chance because a lot of them are kind of silly. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good. That's good. Your chance <laughs> there. So let's, flood, let's flood Callie with some names. All right. Well, let's start meeting some live classrooms. So I am going to go. Let's see. Mrs. Dominski's class. They are hanging out with us in Ontario. Some grade sixes. How are we doing today? We're great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You take her. Get her mask on. All right. Well, we'd love to steal a question. Um, ask questions. Okay. This is Alex. She has a question for you. Hi. Hi. What made you decide to be a scientist and how long ago? So you know what's really, really cool about this field is you don't actually need to be a scientist in order to explore. Um, so I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm a photographer and a storyteller. Um, and I, I have been doing that for, well, for a long time. I started taking pictures when I was a kid. But my actual career path was very different. I studied architecture in college and got my degree in architectural design. Um, and then for the last seven years, I was working at National Geographic Kids and I was making books, designing books for kids about wildlife and, you know, about about the world. But um, I wasn't really exploring. And so it wasn't until I launched Reserva last year that I really started doing more expeditions and more um, more actual wild exploring. So um, I didn't I didn't need to be a scientist in order to do what I love. And I think that's what's um, what's a really important message for everyone to hear is you can be engaged in exploration and in conservation just by playing to your strengths. Um, for me, it was with the camera. So I'm helpful to be on this expedition because I can, I can take that quick picture before the frog jumps away and I can make sure that I've gotten it. So I'm, I'm a valuable asset to the, um, to the expedition, but you could also be someone who's just a really good writer. So a lot of times you have scientists who are going out into the field and um, you know trying to do um, doing amazing work, but don't know how to communicate it. And so if you can have a, a writer on your team who can put everything you've done into um, into really powerful stories and share that, then you can be an explorer. So. Um, yeah, I, I love science. I think it's fascinating, but I'm actually not a scientist. All right. That is an absolutely excellent uh, point, Kelly. Uh, everybody has a different story that led them to what they're doing. Uh, and there's no reason why you have to be an officially trained scientist to make a difference in conservation, to make new discoveries, to be curious uh, and get out and explore. So I'm going to put uh, a little banner up here with the website to Reserva. So anybody who wants to find more information about donating, about um, doing one of your own fundraisers, and of course, naming the frog, not Froggy McFrogface though, but a good name. <laughs> uh, there's lots and lots uh, of things that you can find uh, to take part in, so very cool. All right, Mr. Fulton's class, joining us in Creston, Ohio. Let me bring them into the call. There they are. How are we doing, Ohio? I'm good. Wow, look at your screens. That's so cool. Um, our question is, what is your favorite animal that you found? Oh my gosh, that is such a hard answer. Uh, um, well, on on the site, I mean, I've got to say the new the new species of frog only because I 
I think when I was growing up, I just didn't realize that there were new species left to be discovered. So to be in the presence of one that's just not even known to science yet is really surreal. So I think for me, it was very, it was really sticky. It was like, it was kind of like if you've ever had those jelly slugs that you can like throw at the wall and they stick or even the sticky frogs, it really felt like that. And so um, I, I really enjoyed interacting with that, with that animal. But for me, the, my favorite animal I've ever photographed in the field would have to be the African leopard because they're really elusive. They're, they're kind of like house cats, but like way bigger and more powerful. And finding one is just like, it's such a thrill. There's such a, it's such a gem. Um, I think they're really beautiful and they're, they're fun to watch. So, um, and they pretty much look good in every photograph. So that's sort of a photographer's dream. So yeah, I'd have to say the African leopard. All right. Well, we've got uh, Miss Hen's class who's tuning in in Georgetown, Ontario, uh, sending in messages via Facebook. So don't forget to send us in a question or two and anybody else uh, introduce yourselves as well. Uh, they sent in a few name options, but I think, well, we'll go a few of them. Donut, Yoda, Flipper, my favorite okay. Pablo out of the list. Yoda. So here's something I didn't mention. We are looking for that scientific name, that two-part binomial name with the genus, which we have, and then the species in Latin. But we're also looking for the common name, the name that we'll all just refer to it by. So it could be the Yoda frog or, um, yeah, or the donut frog. Uh, but we do have a judged panel. So we have some really amazing judges, seven judges from all around the world. Um, and they are going to be going through these names and judging whether or not it's a fitting name for the frog. And you get the chance to explain why you've chosen that name. So if you can justify Donut Frog or Yoda Frog, be my guest, you're in with a shot. All right, so I think it's definitely gonna take a little time. Maybe take a look at some of those pictures, really get to know the frog before you come up with your name, because you gotta have a good reason. Probably. All right. Let we us may award some. Uh, we may award some awards for like funniest name and things like that too. So don't hold back. All right, fair enough. We're gonna go to Toronto, Ontario this time. Uh, Mrs. Rambaran's class is joining us. Let me bring them in. All right, hey boys and girls, I'll just have to get you to unmute for me before you go. Perfect. We got you now. Oh, can you get a little closer, a little louder, bud? Uh oh. Yeah, the mic. I didn't quite hear you. Okay, the furthest you've traveled, Callie. Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think the furthest I've traveled is to the Marshall Islands, which is about seven thousand miles away from here. Um, it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean between Australia and Hawaii. And it's actually one of my favorite places in the world as well. Um, it's a very, it's a precious spot because as sea levels rise, it's it's heavily threatened. Um, it's a very low lying nation uh, with a, its own unique culture, um, its own people. And um, it's, a, it's a beautiful place that's, it has beaches that are um, like just the width of a single road and you could look at the lagoon on one side and the ocean on the other. It's a sort of a surreal place to be. Um, so yeah, the Marshall Islands, that's the furthest I've gone. All right, very cool. Uh, where should we go next? Let's go to Thornhill. We've got Madame Ford's class joining us. Let me bring them in. All right, and if you don't mind unmuting for me, we'd love to grab a question. Huh, I see you are <laughs> muted, um, but maybe the microphone's not cooperating today. So uh, Madame Ford, if you wanna put uh, your question into the private chat and I can make sure that we work it in. But uh, for some reason, doesn't like the, the mic is gonna cooperate with us. Okay, let's grab another classroom. Let's go now to Mrs. Robinson six sevens in Petawawa. Let me bring them up and if you, there we go. All right. How are we doing, six sevens? Good. Good. You can pull your mic down. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, what is the biggest animal you have on the show site? 
That's a really good question. Um, for, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the size difference is between the puma and the spectacled bear, but those are two of the biggest. One thing that we're trying to find out, and we need to get more camera traps and spend more time on the site, we have heard anecdotal reports that there are jaguars on this site. And of course, jaguars are a very large cat um, with one of the strongest bites in the animal kingdom. And so we've heard that jaguars have been seen in the, in the lower elevation of our site, um, but we haven't yet collected scientific evidence. So until we can affirmatively say for sure they're there, we've seen them, uh, we can't guarantee that they're there. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that they are. Um, we'll see. All right. Madame Ford, I see the camera's working. So let's cross our fingers. We got the mic too. Go ahead and unmute for me. <laughs> Can you repeat that? How many new discoveries do you make each year? Uh, wow, that's a really good question because it's it's going to be really different from one place to another. In this particular area, the scientists who are operating on this site are actually making quite a few discoveries. Um, on this particular expedition, they found this new species of frog. Uh, they also found a new species of rat, which is really, really rare to find a new species of mammal. So they found a new species of rat. Um, they also found three new species of orchids. Um, so, and that was just on a four day expedition. So they go back to the field fairly often, a couple times a year. It's a little harder because of COVID now, but um, I think that in this particular area of the Choco, because it's so understudied, they they could be, you know, 20 new orchids in a year or uh, maybe 10, five or 10 new reptiles or amphibians. Um, it's actually more common than you would expect. So one of our youth council members is, I think she's only 22 and she has already worked on the publication of 12 new species of frogs. So that gives you an idea of just how, how exciting this region is. And that's just the bigger stuff. I don't even know about insects. They're really understudied there. Um, and so if you wanna become an entomologist and study insects, there's a very good chance that you could discover a lot of new species, like, I mean, dozens, hundreds of new species in this region. All right, very cool. Um, I think that's a really good point too, because I think some students think there's nothing left to explore or discover, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, all the species you mentioned in the rainforest, especially small species, um, we hosted Sylvia Earle this morning. So obviously we got into a little ocean action and she was talking yeah. about there are, could be millions of species left to find in our ocean. Yeah. And there, I mean, I think that there are 1.7 or 1.8 million known species to science. And they think that there could be as many as 8 million or even 12 million species out there. And so it's kind of anyone's game. You want to discover a species. It's a lot of hard work. Once you discover one, you have to go through the processes of proving that it's new and describing it. And that process can take up to a year or so, a year or more. Um, and then you have to publish it so that everyone knows that there's a new species out there. So there are a lot of species um, that have been discovered but not yet described. Um, and for example, we have a, one of our youth council members, his name is Andy Better. And you can find him on Instagram at Andy Better Bugs. He spent a couple months in the Ecuadorian Chaco um, he's actually Ecuadorian himself, and he spent a couple months there, and he discovered 80, uh, 80 undescribed species of arachnids just in this plot. And so arachnids are like spiders, right? So 80 species that haven't yet been described, they're probably new. And because he's only 19 years old, he's like, doesn't know how to do that yet. So they're just piled up, all the information waiting to be described. All right. And so Sylvia did weigh in this morning on the frog name and she, her wish was that it wouldn't be Kermit. So that was. Okay. We actually do have one or two Kermit submissions. So I will take that into account. I'm not surprised. All right. <laughs> well, classroom's still joining us. If you do have to duck out, feel free. I know it's getting close to the end of the day for a lot of classrooms on the East coast, but if you have another question, give me a wave at the camera and I'll come back uh, and visit your class. 
I want to make sure that we work in a follow-up if your group does have one. So just give me a wave and we'll come back uh, your way. All right, here we go. Hello. Okay. Go ahead, Sebastian. Have you ever been in danger during the expedition? Uh, yes, actually, that's a really good question. On this particular expedition, we experienced a, a type of danger that I did not foresee. There was civil unrest in the region because of some tax things, making it really hard for the local communities to survive. Um, they were having a hard time getting by because of gas taxes and things like that. And so there was civil unrest and they, um, they went on strike. And so the very first day that, uh, sorry, the last day of our expedition, we were supposed to leave and go to the capital city of that province to do some education work with kids. And um, as we were about to leave, we got a satellite call in from someone saying, don't leave. The city is literally on fire. Um, you have to stay there and we'll figure something out. And so the next day we stayed an extra night in camp. And the next day we, we got out and when we got down to, to, our, um, to our site, like kind of uh, hub where we actually could have a phone and stuff like that, um, we found out that the strikes were growing and that we weren't going to be able to leave the province if we didn't leave like immediately. So we hopped in the car and just like bolted as fast as we could to try to make it into Quito because they were starting to close the borders. And as we left, we passed a massive truck coming in and we found out that about 15 minutes later, that truck uh, made a barrier on the only access point to the province. So even though I wasn't in, we weren't in like bodily danger from that, we were in danger of being completely stuck there for several weeks. Um, and then civil unrest actually spread and there was um, a, effectively a civil war between the indigenous people and the government about a week later over a separate issue. And so I actually got stuck there for several days without, um, without being able to leave and fell asleep to the sound of explosions just a couple blocks from my hotel because there were some homemade mortars and just a lot of fighting. So that was the only time I've ever been in actual, like actual danger. Um, but I will say that the most scared I've ever been was when I was in the Colombian rainforest, Colombian cloud forest, excuse me. Um, I had a, a headlamp and a like a strobe and that was you know lighting my way down this path. I was walking completely by myself for about half a mile to where I was um, sleeping and I was totally alone and my light went out, completely went out and I was hiking on this like really steep, not a cliff, but a, a, a steep edge. My, my light completely went out. So I was in the utter darkness and I had to fish around in my bag to find something. And I'm totally afraid of the dark. So I had to fish around in my bag and I found a, a headlamp with like a half dead battery. And so I was like holding my tiny flashlight and it's kind of like if you ever have used one of those um, key flashlights that's about how bright it was. And the moment I turned it on, a large mammal crossed the path right in front of me. I have no idea what it was because I had stepped on my glasses earlier that night. So I didn't, I couldn't even see it. Like I have no idea what it was, but I felt I was, that's the scared, most scared I've ever been. Was I ever in any real danger? I don't think so. Like, I don't think those rainforest animals really want anything to do with me, but that was so scary. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, when you go to some of those places, there is a little bit of risk involved, especially when you're in a remote area like the rainforest. Yeah. All right. Madame Ford, I think I see someone sitting front and center. Do you have a question? Yeah, we have two quick small uh, questions. Okay. okay. So, yeah, before when you were showing um, like the different types of species, how do you know that there's a certain amount of one? Like, did you go around and count? Wow. And then, and sorry, and then the second question. Oh, sure. The longest expedition. So it was the longest what was expedition? Longest expedition, yeah. Um, okay, so for the first question, that is a really good question. Um, the scientists have to make estimates, so they will go to survey an area where that species is known to live and see how many they can find in that area, and then they sort of extrapolate. So there are a lot of animals and plants for which they don't have enough 
data to know how many there are. Um, and if you go to, uh, if you Google IUCN red list, that's where you can find that information. Um, and sometimes it'll say deficient data. They just say like, we don't know, we don't even want to guess. Um, but sometimes they'll say, you know, we were only able to find one of these frogs here. Odds are if there's one frog, there's going to be more than one because someone had to make that frog. Um, and so they can, they can sort of make a light guess, but no one really knows for sure um, on some of the smaller animals. So sometimes when they get to larger animals, like, um, you know, black rhino in, in South Africa um, or in, in Africa in general, sometimes you can get an exact count because they're so big, you can, you can just count them. Um, but with those smaller animals, it's a lot harder and they rely on scientific surveys from the, the, the scientists living in those countries. That's a really good question. Um, okay, the second question, the longest expedition, I'm actually very excited about this one. This is a, this is, um, a good plug. The longest expedition is my next one. So the next one is gonna be in November and uh, we need to go back to the site, in, to this particular site. And because of COVID, we can't spend any time in the town. We can't interact with people um, or, you know, stay in the little local hostel or anything like that. So basically I am going straight from the airport with my tent straight to the site and gonna be camping there for two straight weeks. So it'll be 14 or 15 days on the site. And it's gonna be really hard to keep all my camera batteries charged because the solar panel situation doesn't work all that well with clouds up above. And in a cloud forest that you only have about a two hour window in the morning usually where the clouds haven't yet risen above you. So uh, my longest yeah, camping expedition will be two weeks and that's gonna be November 9th to 25th. All right. Well, first of all, a huge thank you to all the classrooms who joined us live today, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, or uh, joining us in a camera spot. Thank you for all your great questions. And then Callie, I have to say thank you so much for you know everything you're doing with Reserva, uh, getting youth activated. And I think that's the biggest the biggest problem sometimes is, is students feel like they're young and maybe their voice doesn't count or they, they don't have a big enough platform. But you know, that couldn't be further from the truth, whether it's writing letters to your local government, connecting with organizations like yours, youth can have power to make a difference. Absolutely. So please do get in touch. I think Joe has maybe shared my the website or um, I can, yeah, I can put more information out there, but you can just get in touch with us. I reply to every email and um, would love to see your frog names too, so. All right, so there's your weekend homework. Let's start. Uh, pumping some frog names onto the website, but really think about it. Have a really good reason for your frog name. And also for the teachers out there, uh, we got this up. I know this is a really short notice, but um, we do have a reserveawildt.org slash education, and there is a two-day lesson plan that goes with this frog naming thing. So if you want to teach a little bit around how to name a new species, we do have some content up there that you can use. So um, definitely encourage you to at least check it out. All right. Awesome. Well, again, thanks everyone for joining. Callie, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. And we are going to sign off for the weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.